Hello, and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast, and I am your host, Samuel. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire country. And it doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing to diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 5% performer within your role in sales, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Today we have with us Christian Pusateri. He actually comes from the med tech space, more specifically software sales. I get a lot of questions about this space. You know, a lot of people in healthcare sales, uh, they, they're interested in transitioning into the software side of healthcare sales. And what Christian does is really, really interesting stuff. Uh, he works for a company called Claronav, and they're a surgical navigation company. So he's responsible for selling the software that surgeons use to actually navigate their way around the body using different devices in surgery. Uh, a lot of you might not be familiar with this space, so this is definitely going to be an episode that you're going to love and learn from. And for those of you that are, you might not be familiar with Christian and, ex- and specifically what his company does. So as always, thank you for listening to the Medical Sales Podcast, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. Christian, how are we doing today? Hey, Samuel. How are you, man? Fantastic. No complaints. Uh, Making it happen another day in 2021. Uh, So today, everyone, we have with us Christian Pusateri. And you know what? Before I say any more, Christian, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody who you are and what it is you do? Well, um, so I've I've been in uh, medical technology for about uh, 12, 13 years. I currently work for a company that creates, manufactures um, visualization and navigation uh, for um, uh, ENT, CMF, OMFS, oral maxillofacial, uh, different disciplines in in, uh, in surgery, and so uh, that basically is um, software, uh, camera tracking, um, algorithmic software, camera tracking, the two core components. But uh, we're used in the operating room and private practice all over the world. Nice. Um, uh, that's uh, and that company's called uh, Clarinet. Excellent. So let, let's clear something off right off the bat. So when you say med tech. Now, I think, I think some people listening, they don't quite know what that means. Does that mean medical device? Does that mean software sales and healthcare? Go ahead and describe for us what exactly does med tech mean and where you fit in. Yeah, I think, I think med tech is a broader term, uh, and, I, and I do use it on purpose. Some of these terms are interchangeable, but med, medical device uh, is very specific. You know, it's, it's devices that are used in surgery typically, but um, which, te- you know, you could say that it's a med tech company. But when I say my career has been spread across medical technology, it's because um, it's, it's kind of the gamut of not just hardware, also software, um, not just surgical devices, but, you know, practice management, you know, to me, that's all under the umbrella of medical technology. Got it. Got it. So in software sales, who, who's your call point? I mean, who are you actually selling to and who makes a decision on what's actually utilized by whatever the account is? Well, uh, you know, in the beginning years ago, I was working for a really big Fortune 300 uh, and they had a practice management software and they had an imaging software. So that was a very specific call point. You know, it was private practice. Um, you know, my particular area was oral maxillofacial surgery. So I was calling on private practice dentists, periodontists, oral surgeons, and then some hospitals. Um, and now our software is, is not management based at all. It's very specifically imaging visualization software and it's proprietary and it only comes with our hardware product, which is a cart based. Um, uh, it's a cart based, uh, uh, basically camera and, and laptop and setup. So, um, so, you know, there's, there's both ends of the pie and there's, there's a lot to talk about in, uh, in both those areas. Yeah. And we'll get into it because we want to, you know, I want everyone to hear kind of how your day rolls out and really make their own comparison on what they understand about pharmaceutical sales, medical device sales, and other sales within healthcare. But before we get into that and what your day looks like, let's talk about, you know, how did you even get into the space? Take me back to college. Uh, what was your major and, and where were you planning to go? I was an English major. Uh, <laughs> I got out of college. And, you know, there was, I had a kind of a pivotal moment in college, which was um, I broke my neck in a diving accident just at a, at a party, 4th of July. Uh, no drinking involved. I, was, uh-huh. uh, I can do enough damage sober, apparently. Um, but I dove off a pier into shallow water and I had a, I had a C4, C5 fracture. Uh, I was instantly not paralyzed, but stuck. So I was, um, uh, I was uh, medevaced, choppered to Baltimore shock trauma, which I was lucky. It was one of the best shock trauma 
centers in the country. And they tried traction for four and a half hours. They gave me a pill and they said, okay, Christian, this is going to keep you awake, but you're not going to remember anything after this. I didn't even know that the matrix thing was real, but like it really was, or right. rather the, it's, that's more like the men in black, the, <laughs> like the camera thing. Like I literally remember them saying that and nothing else. Wow. So they tried traction for five hours and they ended up, um, you know, doing a tracheotomy. They did an anterior, they did a whole, they accessed my neck from both ways. I got the five inch scar on the back of my neck, but what they had told me at the time, I was, I became close with my, with the surgeon, the neurosurgeon that put me back together. And he was like, look, you know, the interesting thing about your break, he's like, it was kind of tricky. If you had done this 10 years ago, your chances of walking again would have been significantly reduced, like double digit reduced, you know, medical technology is advancing so quickly that we were able to, to put you back together. And I mean, I, uh, it's fully functioning. I mean, this happened Wow. almost 15 years ago, you know, ever, ever since, I mean, I go snowboarding, I go wakeboarding. I mean, I do stuff with some high impact God, you know, knock on wood, but it, it came back full. So that really stuck with me. And that was my defining moment. And so when I got out of college, I was just looking for that in and it took me nine months, but finally after asking around and, you know, interviewing with everyone of the sun, I interviewed with Stryker and Smith yeah. and Matthew Smith and nephew. And I finally got uh, an offer. I got my foot in the door. And then from there, I just kept following my interest. Now that's a story. Um, what was the rehab like on that? Uh, two months of basically sitting on a couch. Two months on a couch. It was supposed to be, they said three, but by two, I was so out of my mind board. <laughs> I was like, I was like rehabbing myself. There wasn't really a rehab protocol. It was just don't move. Like, we don't even want you. We don't want you doing it. We don't want you ascending stairs. They were, they were like, because if I fell again and really broke it, it would have been a mess. Um, so it was two months to basically think about what I had done, but also, you know, to kind of thank my lucky stars that I was still around and, and ask myself, well, I was really lucky. And is there a way I can pay this forward? And, and am I interested in the science and the technology that fixed me? And it happened that I was. Wow. Um, so after two months, you were just walking again, just like that. I was walking out of the hospital again. I was walking right away. I never was paralyzed. I had tingling. I was, uh, my surgeon told me I was um, uh, th about two thirds of a millimeter away from severing my spinal cord. Unbelievable. Now, if that had happened, it I would be sitting in a wheelchair right now talking to you, but, uh, but that didn't happen. Luckily. Christian, that is a, you, you couldn't have said it better. That is a life defining moment. So, okay. So you graduate and this experience happens and you were looking for an end. What'd you find? First one, the first job that came my way was uh, selling dental implants and uh, biologics to general practitioners, oral surgeons, prosthodontists, periodontics. Um, and it was a great foot in the door gig. Um, you know, it was a smaller company, it was an Asian company. And uh, they were taken, they won college grads because uh, the pay wasn't nearly as good as it was in other parts of medical and right. pharma. Right. And they were, and they just grinded us, you know, every day we had to be in the home office at 8 a.m. We had meetings every day from eight, which was an hour away from where I was living. So it was, you know, you go there from eight, you, uh, you know, meetings until about 10, 30, 11, and then you're supposed to go out on in the field, you sell until five, and then you have to send in a report at the end of the day about what you did to your, your branch manager. And it was, you know, when I take that job now, obviously, you know, that's not the kind of job you're going to take. <laughs> that's right. a good out of college foot in the door, foot sure. in the door job when you're learning and you're cutting yeah. your teeth. And it was great for that. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. And, and that was. Was that Henry Shine or was that no? That was some, that was before Henry. Schein. That was a Korean company. That was a Korean company called uh, Hi uh, Hi Okay, got it, got it. Okay, then what what was the move? You know, why did you leave that place, and what were you thinking? Well, one of the things I love about this career, and I mean, you know, this as well, is that uh, you know, if you want to travel and you want to see other geographies and other cities, you know, you can do it with this with this in this career. Once you get a skill set, it's so technical. And if you can really learn to speak the language, you've got value. Um, yeah. Kind of like being a nurse. So I had always wanted to experience the West Coast. I was born and raised in the Atlantic. You know, I worked in New England a little bit, but I always wanted to live on the West Coast. So I put that, put it out there, started interviewing. Again, took me about eight months, mm -hmm. but um, got a job with uh, Henry Schein. Pretty okay. big, you know, and I went from working at a pretty small company to a $10 billion company. And that was, that was an interesting change. Yeah. What was your experience like at Henry Schein? I mean, what? What was the difference between where you've just been coming from? Well, it's, uh, uh, when you get to those big companies, you know, you're talking about, you know, you're a number, um, not good or bad. It's just what it is. They're, they're managing thousands of employees. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's much more black and white. Like, look, you've got a quota. You've got to go out and, and you got to hit it. Um, and I kind of liked the, uh, 
I like the breadth of products that I had. I love the brand name. I never walked into an office. I never went into a hospital or private practice where people didn't know the company I was working for. That was nice. And we had some really branded products with great market penetration. So, you, you know, we could go into almost any account and they were already buying something. Now you're just trying to get them to buy a little more, you know? Oh, wow. So what, what prompted the move from Henry Schein? So you know, the thrust of, for me was just following what I'm interested in and specialization. And for, it, it served me well. You know, I certainly know guys that have made more money uh, doing, and it, you know, the comp's been great, but if you're money motivated, um, you can certainly follow that. For me, it's about, I want to I want to be more specialized. Like I want to get to the point where the things that I know and that I'm doing, there's six people in the country that really can speak to. That's That's been the thrust of my career. So yeah. I, you know, I went to a company that was, you know, it was software and imaging and, um, and imaging was really hot. And, uh, I wanted to ride that wave and, and that was where, where most of my interests lie. So I went to a company called Actium. So, so you saw the opportunity, you wanted to ride that wave, you say, but when you got into it, you actually started to really love it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So talk to us about what was Superhuman Inc. That was my, uh, that was my, my side hustle. Okay. okay. <laughs> Shout yeah. out to Gary V. <laughs> okay. Hey, come on. I know Gary very well. All right. Yeah. So Dr. I mean, I subscribe, you know, I was like, uh, I was lucky California's an early adopter market. If you're selling anything in California, you're going to start bumping elbows with some of the brightest minds, not just in the country, but on the planet. And I was, I was working with doctors that were internationally renowned. These guys were talking at podiums all over the planet. Sure. You know, they were getting paid $25,000 to go speak at an event, you know? So I was in, um, you know, for example, I was at USDC telemedicine down in San Diego, which is right outside La Jolla. And there's this little strip in La Jolla, California, that's got the most Nobel laureates per square mile of anywhere on the planet. Sure. And they, a lot of them work out of USDC telemedicine. And I was, and this is like, I don't know, six years ago, five years ago. I, I was there just on business. I was working with the CMF OMFS department, but I happened to be in the same hall as where they had this Da Vinci robot that was a port. It was a, uh, it was the ability to remote into surgery. So this was a generator port and there was a receiver port in like Africa. And they were working on being able to have a doctor slide his hands in yeah. to this little surgery port. And the way that he moved his hands would be the way the robotic hands moved right. like 7,000 miles away. Right. And this was bananas. Now, the funny thing was I started asking questions and there was an attending there or something. I was just asking questions about it. He was kind of answering them like reserved, like, wait, who are you? And then, you know, I finally got him to open up and he's like, well, you know, the funny thing about this, it's got a four second lag time. So that's our biggest problem. And, you know, we kind of had a laugh, like if I'm on the operating table, I don't want that. But I was fascinated that this thing existed sure. and getting exposed to that kind of technology um, for me was the, was the most fascinating thing that I, that I was doing. And I wanted to see if I could build like some sort of company around creating general awareness around these products that are on the cutting edge that you don't hear about in mainstream news. You're not even going to necessarily hear about this stuff on like wired or crunch the tech crunch. You know, I was getting insights to stuff. That, so I just wanted to find a way to share that with people. And this was the platform. Superhuman. And that, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And that led, you know, that, you know, just, just to go off, uh, you know, for anybody who's thinking about starting a side hustle that started off pretty humbly. That was basically like, you know, I took like 15, 20 grand, I think it was. And, uh, I had a friend of a friend who was kind of in, in the Hollywood scene. He was a good direct, you know, an editor and producer and had done some small, so I said, you know, he's like, I was like, how much would it take to kind of make like a teaser? And just to put together like, you know, kind of a show, like a docu-series where I go around interviewing people about the latest stuff. So we did this. We filmed this back in like the cusp of 2017, 2018. You know, we edited it for a few months. We went around Hollywood shopping it to different production studios, you know, got some good feedback. I did the whole thing, man. Like yeah, I was yeah, yeah. selling everything. And um, and so it, it was in waves. We didn't get to take off. But, you know, just six months ago, we just kind of kept, we keep grinding on it. Mm -hmm. Six months ago, I actually got Aubrey de Grey to come on my podcast. And if you're, if you're familiar, he's considered the father of anti-aging. He's like one of the most well-respected, most desired speakers on anti-aging the planet. He's got the sense foundation, which does all the research on that. He came on the show and gave me an hour of his time and talked and like, uh, you know, it's, that's where it went. So yeah. it's, it's been really so, rewarding. So what it does is it creates media for any thought leaders to use around whatever they're selling and devices, whatever, whatever they're into. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's basically media trying to get the brightest minds and mainly tech that are on the cutting edge of what we're inventing, what we're creating, 
um, to just talk about what they're doing to kind of come at it. Here's the thing, Daniel, these guys are working 70 hour weeks. They're working a lot of times in like the basement floor of, you know, Harvard or USC somewhere. Like they don't come up for air much. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Aubrey de Grey, I can't say that about him at all. He's obviously, he does speak, but these guys are busy. And I just wanted to give him another platform from basically a super fan that, you know, would get them to talk about it. Got it. Okay. So that's superhumans. And then, and then now we, we get here with Claire O'Neill. Saying that correctly, right? Claire O'Neill. Yeah. So, so yeah. talk to us about what got you to that role and what, give us a little bit more detail around what you do in that space. So this was just a chance to basically blend the kind of both those worlds. So Clarinet is creating a visual visualization technology for surgeons and it's not new technology. It was, uh, it was invented. It was basically meant for military use, you know, more than 30 years ago. And it, it, the first application, which was, uh, the first application was, uh, by my CEOs, their engineers, and they did it in the early nineties. And, and it was one of those places where I'm like, listen, this is the basically the newest thing that exists in my industry you know, where I butter my bread and where I know what I'm talking about. So it's kind of combined superhumans because it's cutting edge, but it's actually practical because I can go work at this company, have a lot to offer. At that point, I had a dozen years in the space. So I knew a lot of the distribution networks. You know, I know a lot of the key opinion leaders, the people to talk to, the channels. So it's kind of a way to blend both. And uh, and it's very, very new. You know, I'm, I'm not selling, I, I unlike Henry Shine, where you walk in or like with a striker, you know, or a Pfizer, you walk in and everyone knows what you're what you're selling in your product portfolio. Right, right, right. Not only have they no, not know the, pro- I'm explaining the technology and mm-hmm. I'm explaining the company and I'm explaining the bat, like nobody knows this. So we're like, you know, we're five years ahead of the curve and we're looking only for early adopters. So, so talk to us then, what does what your day look like? I mean, how, walk us through a day in, in this space and, you know, from, from what you decide to do before you leave the house to the customers you're actually going to see, prior to the appointments, that kind of thing. It's definitely, it's a blend between macro and micro okay. in, a, in a really big way. So an average day when I'm working with my distributors who I had to sign up, but I'll get to that in a second. Your, your distributors, you have a relationship where you're making a product and you don't have access to the market, but you go through a distributor who's got great access to the market. So these are reps that have call points. They're all trying to see about a hundred accounts a month. And you're trying to, you're trying to get on their screen, get on their radar, get them excited, incentivize them teach them about the product and you're just hoping they bring you leads. And that is, those days are really grindy. I mean, you're just calling all these equipment reps and I'm doing that nationwide for multiple distributors. Then on the other days, you know, when I started, I didn't have any distributors. So there are days I'm waking up and I'm like, I got to find a way to get in front of C-suite. So how do I find this? How do I find the, uh, the equipment director of a hundred million dollar or, or, close to like a billion dollar company, half a billion dollar company. How do I get in touch with these guys? Yeah. And there's a lot of methods we can talk about there, but like I've got to get in the right. Then once you get them interested, you got to pitch, you know, I'm calling up key opinion leaders that I know have followings on social media and that speak around the world, around the country. I'm trying to get on their radar and have them give me time. And we do a zoom call and I'll just say, look, this is who I am. This is what I'm selling. This is the applications in your practice or for your patients. And, uh, and I'm trying to sell them. So I'm trying to sell, you know, it's, it's a little bit of B2B, a little bit of B2C, but you got to keep them, you know, you have to keep the needle moving in terms of bringing in sales, direct sales from the market, and then also kind of building this infrastructure around it. Wow. How long is a typical sales cycle for one of your uh, navigation systems? Three to six months. Three to six months. So from introduction to actual sale, three to six months. That's not too crazy. Got mm-hmm. it. And, and uh, okay, so how so you've had this role for almost two years now, mm-hmm. right? And so now you're saying that the majority of your leads come from equipment, equipment reps now. Correct. What's the incentive for them? So it's one of the port, it's one of the products in their product portfolio. So they get a, uh, they get paid on it, just like they get paid for selling anything else. They get a commission. Got it, got it, got it. So, so Claro Nav is, it's, it's contracted with other device companies for you guys all to work together and they're incentivized to work with you and, and do what they can to bring you leads. Correct. Yeah. The model is, is uh, almost always in medical, either direct to market or distribution. Um, most companies will do both in the beginning. We do both. I still can sell direct. Um, but once you start bringing on distributors, they don't like you to sell direct because they don't want you to undercut them because your price is always lower than their price. Right. right. So wherever I open up a distributor, I, I don't sell direct in that market anymore. Kind of as a, kind of as a courtesy. Um, sometimes, you know, your, your, uh, 
your officers of your company won't like that because they want as many sales as possible. So it's kind of on, you know, it's on me to figure out and play, you know, politics a little bit. Gotcha. What's the competition like in this space? There's basically two of us um, that really have any share. There's six or seven companies globally that, that have that are into this technology developing it, but only two of us that have any real share. That is beautiful. So I mean, talk to us a little bit about that. Is that it sounds beautiful, but is that as good as it sounds, or does that make things a bit challenging? Right, because there's no competition, you mean? Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you know, you're talking about it's great when you're selling. Uh, it's great when you're selling, um, you know, bone screws and tacks in a market that has to use those on every single, you know, facial surgery or in, for, in thoracic and it's standard of care. Right. Great. Um, we're not standard of care yet. So there's only two, there's only mainly two of us because we're trying to get that standard of care. We think this is the next iteration of uh, a visualization and surgery. Got it. So, you know, just so the, the listeners have a clear understanding of what this is. How is this, this cutting edge technology benefiting the provider? Explain to us why they want to be a part of it. That's a great question. So, you know, surgery, um, the arc of surgery, all surgical surgeries, the outcomes have to get more precise. Surgical times need to be reduced as much as they possibly can. Um, liability to, to the provider has got to be reduced as much as we can. That has to be the arc of all medical technology. Otherwise, we're just inventing things for the sake of inventing things. And we're adding to the overall cost of healthcare to people without actually increasing efficacy sure. and accuracy. So, you know, there's been for the last, you know, 3D printing came into my space a long time ago because you can 3D print guides for surgery that make it more accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, today Stryker's got a partnership with 3D Systems for a lot of oral surgery trauma where, you know, they work hand in hand. Stryker obviously has all the plates and all the metal and all the hardware. And then uh, 3D systems will, will basically take the scan of the patient and they'll 3D print a replica, both for planning and then also for guiding screws and drills so that everything goes in the proper place. We are kind of the next level of 3D printed guidance because what we're offering is real-time navigation. So what, you're, what the doc, what the provider's looking at, the doctor's looking at, you know, whether it's a spine surgeon or an ENT or an oral maxillofacial surgeon, he's looking at a screen. He's doing heads up surgery. He's not looking at his patient. And that screen on that screen is basically a diacom of the patient, which is a 3D image. And then in real time, it's got an avatar of the handpiece, of the screw, of the drill. And you're seeing that on the screen overlaid on the patient's uh, diacom file. And that diacom file obviously is showing their bone. It's showing where their nerves are, where you know the sinuses, all this stuff, all the sensitive anatomy. So they get to see in real time, like, am I close to that nerve or am I too facial? You know, 3D printed guides don't offer that real time navigation. Got it. I mean, this sounds like it just makes too much sense to not do. Where's the resistance? Why isn't this just standard? Why isn't this standard of care? Yeah, listen, you know, we're, we're tackling the same challenges that every new product uh, has to tackle coming to market. Um, you know, you need use case uh, to, you know, obviously we're, we have a ton of research. We've been, re we've been uh, there are clinical studies from academia, right. um, third party, you know, private companies. We've got a ton of research. So that's all there saying that we're more accurate. But then, you know, there's going to be a time delay on getting that to market. So we've been in the market with this particular product for six years. Um, and we still need everyone, you know, you, doctors to be able to use this and, and, and report back our research and say, yes, this is working, which they are. But it takes time. Uh, when you're talking about hospitals, you know, I can introduce this to a hospital. You know, we had I was doing demos um, in greater New York to big name hospitals in December, January. And they all said, yep, we want one. And it's now almost June and we're just about to get the PO because they have a whole regulatory, they have a whole um, purchasing department that, you know, you got to get three to four to five signatures. If you're talking about private practices and, you know, ambulatory, things like that, outpatient places, they still have, you know, a smaller purchasing department, but you've got to get a few, you've got to get the, the owner, the principal to sign off. Um, you know, you got to make sure that they have seen a couple presentations. So there's just a little bit of delay in, in getting it to be standard of care. Got it. And you're responsible for every call point to get the purchase order eventually completed, to get everything done. It, it's all in easy. the U.S. right now, yeah. In the U.S., yeah. Yeah. That's, We're that's lean. Good, Christian. <laughs> that's, We're lean. That's good. Um, what are the resources like with the company? You know, for someone that wants a role like this or is interested in something like this, how does it look as far as support from the organization? What do they expect of you? 
by yourself? And what do they, you know, what do they jump in to definitely help you with, if anything? Well, everybody needs to be open to kind of wearing multiple hats. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's, you know, if, if you go get a straight up sales job, really what matters to that company is that you hit your quota every quarter, um, you know, and that's it. But when there's other problems, you know, I, I'm, I've, I've, with this company, I've had to put on a marketing hat, operations hat, setting up distribution network. That's not sales. That's business, business operations, business development. Um, you know, anything that I'm skilled enough in to offer, I've got to, I've got to offer it up and you got to be willing to do that. And so you're, you know, I kind of really want to see, I'm really invested in the company, really invest in the company. It's the first time I could say I'm really invested in the company. And I mean, that might sound selfish, but up until this point, I was really learning. I wanted to learn and I was trading my time to a company and in return, I was learning. And when I left, no harm, no foul, no hard feelings, but like I'm moving on this company. I really want to see succeed because I believe in the product. And I think that whether or not I'm there, they got to do well, you know what I mean? So that encourages me to do more than whatever might be asked and kind of, you know, go, go above and beyond, I guess. Yeah. I mean, probably goes for us to say it's changed the nature of how you treat your job. I mean, the fact that you're so invested here, you're just, you're operating on a completely different level. Yeah, I think so. Excellent. Excellent. And, it, and Excellent. it's, and it's easy, it's easy to get complacent too. You know, with those big companies, they can give you a nice little comp package and it's easy to get complacent. Uh, and everyone knows, you You know, sometimes you can call it in and you can kind of hit your quota. And I, you know, I got, I definitely gotten that rut over the years. And, and luckily enough, when I get bored and I get anxious, I start sabotaging myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it works out well for me, but, uh, you know, that's excellent. So, so then Christian, take us back to just how are you making this all happen? I mean, you have an organization that you run yourself, that's stupid human. You're part of this great company, Claro Nab, on the cutting edge. You're clearly making things happen in your current role. What keeps you standard? How do you make all these things happen? Ah, oh, man. Um, you, you, if you, what's that? Um, there's a saying, like, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. But you know what? I, I think it's just following. It's a little bit, not to sound too like, you know, if, if my heart wasn't in this stuff, there would not be enough time. I'm doing more. I accomplish more, way more now mm-hmm. than I accomplished in other roles. You know, when I was at, you know, Actan, for example, was, was definitely like a medical, uh, a standard kind of medical equipment job. You were expected to grind. I was putting in 60 hour weeks pretty frequently. It's yeah. a lot of travel. Um, but I'm doing more now. I'm accomplishing more now and I'm getting more results now, working probably less hours, but just the hours that I'm working more focused because my heart's in it. Like my heart's in the game. So something is something, there's something there about how, like paying attention to kind of like your gut. And following that and doing what's not, com- you know, going to this company wasn't the most comfortable thing. I had a comfortable job before it, um, but I'm sustained and, and I can handle all this because I love it. You know, that's excellent. So for people listening, you know, if they're, if they're a med device rep and they're thinking about this kind of field, or if there's someone that's been B2B to thinking about this kind of field, you know, what would you let them know? Who, who is most qualified to even go the route you went? That's the first thing. And work for a company like Claro now. And then what, what advice would you give to people that are interested in it? If you're interested in it, um, first of all, if, if you're interested in anything, get on LinkedIn and pay for premium. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> that that's the number one thing. Stage advice, actually. That's Seriously, great. man. That's how you and I got connected, Samuel. Right, right, it's, right. It works, man. The best people that I've met all on LinkedIn right now, I just think that we're this unique moment in time where like you can get in touch with who you need to on that platform. So that's the first thing is just get on there and start messaging the people that can answer your questions. Um, but look, the other thing too, is like the first, I spent the first half of my career telling people in interviews and when I was going, you know, I, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, uh, I forget who said it, but an interview is a meeting between two liars. <laughs> and it's so true, man. The inner, you know, the interviewer is lying about how good the job of the company is. The interviewee is lying about what they've done and how great they are. And it's like, make, you know, we're not just straight up lying, but you're embellishing. And I think one of the things that I always said in those interviews uh, for the first half of my career was that I'm money motivated. I'm money, mo- that's all I want. I want to make the money. And that was part of it, but it wasn't all of it. Like I really had a thirst for knowledge and being a specialist. I never said that, but when I started following that a little bit more, my career started to get way more exciting and interesting to me. So I think ask yourself what really motivates you and kind of stay in that space for a few months, like really get clear. Cause I think I spent six years basically kind of lying to myself saying I was just all about the money, but I got the money and I wasn't 
I was strung out. I was like snappy. I'd get kind of snappy with my friends. Mm-hmm. You know, I was kind of burning the candle. You know, I wasn't happier. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, self-awareness is just a big one. Sure. What would you say qualifies who's best fit for this kind of role that you're doing now? Like who could you know straight from where, what they're doing into something like this? I mean, if you're the kind of person that likes being in the operatory, that's pretty handy right now. Um, this kind of technology where you, you know, it's really critical when you've got a cutting edge technology that's not standard of care yet. When you've got like, whether it's a device, you know, a new screw, it, you can have all the research in the world, but it's going to have to work in the operatory. And the only way that's going to happen is if somebody's in that room with that doctor, and you've got to be okay with things going wrong. I was in a case a few months ago, doctor was uh, using the system for the first time and he nicked the lingual nerve uh, in the mouth blood starts going crazy. And I, you know, we, you know, we, we did what we had in that situation, you know, grab gauze from the nurse. We put it, I'm not touching the patient, obviously, but like I'm comfortable in that position and I'm offering basically confidence, support and guidance to the doctor. You know, that was a doctor error, but that stuff's going to go wrong. These doctors have to have a good experience with a product. And if you're someone that likes, you know, treating patients and being as close as you can without being a doctor, this is a great kind of a thing to do. So tell me this, Christian. I mean, you're, you're working on a lot of things. You know, how do you manage all of these things that you want to do in your, with your current employer, with superhumans, and then whatever's going on in your personal life? Share with us. I mean, how do you manage it? What, what is going on? Well, I, listen, that's one of the benefits, I think, of this career is uh, if you start in outside sales, you, you have control of your time. And if you're someone that... Uh, you know, if you're, if you're good at managing your time, you've got access uh, to a lot of different, whether it's, you know, hobbies or if you're making good money, you know, I got into kiteboarding when I was living in LA, which takes a lot of time and it's really expensive. And if I wasn't in medical sales, I wouldn't be able to afford it. And I wouldn't be able to carve out the time to do it. So you get cool hobbies like that. And then, you know, you get older and I have a daughter now and I love spending time with her. And I, you know, I have to travel but it's nice that I can make my schedule that look, I travel when I'm daddy's gone for a few days, but when I'm back, I'm back wow. and I can spend time with her. You know, if you can, I think, dude, you know, you're, how, how long are your kids going to be two, three, four, five? You just get a few years with her this precious. My little girl is, I don't, I don't want to leave her. Okay. So it's a great career for, for being a family person, if that's the way you are too. And when you're young and you're just, you want to have expensive hobbies, you can do that too. And as far as leadership in these kinds of roles, I mean, it sounds like you just talk directly to leadership. You're not necessarily managed by, there's not many people in between direct leadership and your role. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I've got a VP, a global VP, incredibly smart, very dynamic, um, puts up with a lot of my BS. And then basically the CEOs, <laughs> that's, that's the kind of line of command. Um, you know, and there's not a lot in this, in this position, there's definitely a hierarchy. You've got to have hierarchical structures just so that when you disagree at the end of the day, we can disagree, but if he makes a decision, I got to follow it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think hierarchy actually fades a little bit too, as you get into these more smaller cutting edge companies, hierarchy was really big when I was at a big company. There's a very, I couldn't even, you know, my, my, I had a manager, his, my boss's boss, good luck getting that guy, even on the phone, even to take my email. Right. There's just a pecking order. Right, right. So, but now you guys are a close knit family. Is so is this is this something you see for your future, getting into leadership within this space, or are you just kind of like eyes wide open? We'll see where my current focus takes me. I, you know, I've got buddies that are really about climbing the ladder, and they're really about financial security, and they make great money, and they just want to climb the ladder. I got my my cousin in law right now. Uh, you know, he's going back and getting his MBA because he wants to just keep going up the ladder, and he's got great comp, great security, all of it. Um, and I respect that. Uh, and I admire it. Um, you know, for me, I want to get equity. I want to get ownership. Um, so I want to go to companies where I've got something to offer. They're willing to give me some equity for it, or they're willing to let me buy equity for it. And I believe in them. And then we ride this thing until it goes until we can get acquired or until we have an IPO. To me, that's fun. That's really fun. So that's, that's the kind of ride that I'm signing up for. Hey, come on, Christian, preach it. All right. So what, what's some last, some last lines to do with the audience today? Overarching advice, you know, as far as our listenership, people that want to get in, people that are in and people that are leading the way, uh, what would you like to share? You can get in touch with anybody that you need to these days, man. Get on LinkedIn, email me directly. There's a great website. I don't know. Do you use Hunter, Hunter.io? No, no. What's that? 
got it. This this thing is giving me. So there's a website called Hunter.io. I mean, I shouldn't say it. I don't know. It's a secret. Um, no, it's totally public. But you basically you enter in a company name, uh -huh. and it gives you the format of that company's email address. So as long as you know the name of the person you want to get in touch with, you can get their company email address, and you can send them a personalized email just, just that will get delivered. Their, just drop and trace Christian. Telling you, man. Okay. And it gets you right to that person's inbox, That's whether awesome. it's a hiring manager, whether it's a doctor. I mean, look, uh, at the beginning of most of the roles in, in, the, in the first 90 days, one of the first things that I've always done because I've been told to do it is go find your local doctor that's like a champion and just watch them in cases. That's how, that's how reps usually learn best. Um, what they don't tell you is that, you know, a rep is no more qualified than just a person that wants to learn. Like, you know, you can do that anyways. If you want to get into a field that you're not in yet, you know, you can absolutely reach out to your a local doctor, someone that's got something that you think that you want to learn about, and you can ask to just shadow a surgery. And they can scrub you up and you can shadow. You know, you got to be quiet and soft to the side. It's not the most common practice, but that's a little bit of a hack that you could definitely do. You know, it's all there for you. Love it. Love it. Christian, this is awesome. Thank you for the time today. And um, we look forward to hearing what you're doing with Superhumans and how you grow in ClaroNav and seeing all your future moves. Thanks, Angle Man. It's been a pleasure. And that was Christian Pusatiri. Dynamic field he's in and the things he gets an opportunity to do on a daily basis and the type of service and products that he sells. Um, it's fascinating stuff. You know, with, with how fast technology moves in this space, it's a beautiful thing to watch and it's even more of a beautiful thing to be a part of. If you're someone out there that's been listening to this episode and you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I really want to know more about that field. I might want to get into that field myself. Then again, don't hesitate to reach out to us at EvolverSuccess.com or you can find me on LinkedIn under Samuel Adeyinka. Just shoot me a text and one of our client specialists will get back to you and line up a conversation so we can talk about how you can be in a career like this. And of course, Christian's out there. He is on LinkedIn. He's also available to talk to. So make sure you reach out to him. If you're someone that's looking to get into any space within the healthcare sales industry or make a transition from pharma to med device or med device to software sales or med device to biotech, whatever your move is that you want to make, reach out to us. You can find us on EvolveYourSuccess.com, select Attain a Healthcare Sales Role and get in contact with us or find us on LinkedIn and send me a text directly and someone will get back to you and we can line up a conversation and get you into a program that experience success getting people into the roles they want to be in. And if you're a sales professional or you're a sales leader that has a team and you want to see better performance, maybe you're in your own career and you want to see some real development, you know you have things to work on, and you're thinking to yourself, how can I get to the next step? What do I need to do? Again, find us at EvolveySuccess.com, uh, select Improve Sales Performance, or reach out directly to us on LinkedIn through Evolver Success or to me directly at Samuel De Yinka, and we will get back to you and get a conversation going and talk to you about how we can help you reach that level of performance. And if you're a sales leader with a team and you're thinking of doing the same thing, again, reach out to us at EvolverSuccess.com or find us directly on LinkedIn. As always, thank you for listening to the Medical Sales Podcast. We do what we can every single week to bring you guests that have fascinating stories, fascinating fields, and something to share. So make sure you tune in next week for another episode of the Medical Sales Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a couple programs that show you exactly how to break into the medical sales industry, become a top performing medical sales professional, and also how to masterfully navigate your career to executive level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveYourSuccess.com. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews.